Uh, this presentation is about the environmental sustainability of music festivals, an integrative approach to reducing the environmental impact of festivals. Um, the presenters are Hope Barnstead, Jack Shea, and Taylor Garrington. Alright, thanks everyone for coming out and hearing about our project. Um, my name is Jack Shea. I'm Hope Barnstead, and I'm Taylor Garrington. And the title of our capstone project is <coughs> Environmental Sustainability of Music Festivals, an Integrative Approach to Reducing the Environmental Impact of Festivals. Cool, so just to give you a little introduction of how this project even came about, we knew that we would be working on it for two years, so we really wanted to make sure we picked something that we were really passionate about and something that we wouldn't get tired of uh, after a little bit. Um, so we all kind of realized like, how much we all love music and love the environment and wanted to find a way to combine those. As ISAT majors, one of our biggest things is that we're designed to be problem solvers and we're designed to work in a team. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we picked a pro uh, an issue that was appropriate to looking at different systems at play. How we can analyze um, the things that we love and use a project to kind of highlight our skills as ISAT majors. Um, so as a result of our work and research and ideas, um, we created a website that serves as a virtual guidebook um, that caters to festival planners and festival goers. Um, just giving them some recommendations, suggestions, tips on how to be more sustainable in the planning, execution, and uh, enjoyment of a festival. Um, we'll get into the details of that later after we go through our stakeholders and problems. Um, so here's just a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to discuss uh, why music festivals, why they're so prevalent, um, what's their environmental impact. Then we'll identify our stakeholders, the ones that are involved with the, uh, the cultivation of music festivals. Um, from there we'll go into some problems with music festivals, um, environmental issues that is. Then we'll discuss our research, um, including interviews and field work. Uh, we'll go back to the guidebook, give you guys a look at that. Um, then we'll kind of discuss our overarching theme, which is promoting a green lens, and then talk about some future exploration options. Cool, so just to give you an idea of why music festivals, why are these kind of a growing thing? Why is everyone kind of talking about them recently? Um, it's a chance to see your favorite band with a bunch of people. You know, so many people just coming to these events, you know, you're just going to see music because you love it and you're meeting so many people along the way. Um, it's a great value for all involved. A lot of times artists are paid a lot of money to go to these festivals, play one or two sets, as opposed to just going to a venue where they're playing just a little show, kind of reaching just a little bit of an audience. It could be hit or miss. You don't know if anyone's going to show up or not. Um, and it's also great value for the guests or the people attending the music festival. You know, you're kind of paying just a couple hundred dollars to see hundreds plus of bands. Um, it's ability to enjoy music outside, you know, as, as opposed to being stuck in a venue, you're kind of sweaty, you're in the pit, like, you know, you're just kind of pushed up against each other. A music festival allows you to kind of be outside, be in the fresh air. You can be up in the front, like, with all the action, or you can kind of step back, you know, have a picnic outside, just enjoy the music without kind of the, the cramminess. Um, it provides a sense of adventure. Oftentimes, these music festivals are in, like, these different cities that you might not have traveled to otherwise. So a lot of times it's like an incentive to just visit a different city and explore that local community while you're there. Um, it's ability to hear and share new music. I know for me when I've gone to a lot of different music festivals, a lot of times like I've been waiting to see a different band and because of that I've heard a lot of other different uh, musicians that I've actually become a lot of um, really a really big fan of later because I was just waiting and there's always a bit, bunch of different stages going on so you kind of like have to hear different music. Um, and it's a chance to network with like-minded people. I have met people from Norway, I've met people from Canada, I've also met people from the West Coast and people who I've actually met who go to JMU at a music festival. Um, they all are there, again, for the same reason, they all love music, so it's just a way to kind of network with them, connect with them, talk to them at the music festival, and then actually network enough that you can talk to them outside of the music festival. <laughs> um, to give you a little bit of a history of how the music festivals kind of started, how many of y'all have heard of Woodstock? Yeah. It, Woodstock was probably one of the first event, uh, events of its kind, you know, a bunch of different artists over multiple of days, um, you know, it kind of set this precedent for, like, wow, like, a lot of people love just coming here, like, being together, just being with their favorite bands. Um, <laughs> anyway, exactly, this is our intermission, um, so anyway, <laughs> this is the Woodstock portion, um, so exactly, so Woodstock kind of set this precedent this novel idea where you could start to see. <laughs> is that less there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Cool. We just want to make sure we have your attention, you know, the whole time. Um, yeah. So, Woodstock was kind of this novel idea. 
Um, but it was also because it was such a novel idea, no one understood like the environmental impact that would have. And unfortunately, because it was the environmental impact was overlooked, it kind of set the precedent for future uh, festivals to come. So just to give you a couple statistics about current music festivals, to kind of give you an idea of the numbers that we're working with as we dive deeper into the project, there are about uh, 800 music festivals in the United States per year. That statistic was taken from 2014, so that number can fluctuate. I would assume it would even probably go up from here. Um, and there are about 32 million people who attend the United States Music Festival every single year. That's about one in 10 Americans. If you kind of like look at the room, like that's already a lot of people now. Think about it in like a bigger context. That's a lot of people going to a lot of different music festivals every year. And of those 32 million, about 14.7 are millennials. <coughs> Time to give you an idea of the demographics that are attending these music festivals. Um, and just to give you also an idea of how aware they are in like the public eye, um, just from one music festival, uh, particularly Coachella, over the course of just a couple days, from April 10th to the 12th, there were 3.5 million tweets. You know, obviously this is something that's very present, pre prevalent in social media, um, so it's kind of helps kind of get the brand out there, kind of help uh, stir the cultural phenomenon. So when you think of a music festival, this is probably the idea that you're getting in your head. You know, this outdoor, like, you know, with all my friends, favorite bands, like, beautiful stage outside, probably people on people's shoulders, having a great time. This is probably <coughs> not the image that you're thinking or associating with a music festival. All right, so um, to begin our research, we identified a couple of groups of stakeholders. Um, we identified the music festival planners, the music festival goers, the artists performing at music festivals, as well as the local community surrounding the location of the festival. Um, and we chose these groups because we felt like they are the ones with the most invested interest and also the ones with the potential to have the most impact um, and implementing sustainable practices throughout a music festival. Um, so first we have the music festival planners, and these are going to be the um, people who are executing all the different aspects of the music festival. <coughs> so ultimately they're the ones that are going to be setting the tone for whether um, environmentally sustainable practices are at the forefront of the planning process or just an afterthought. Um, and in doing this, they have to bring in a bunch of different organizations, such as food vendors, um, energy co providers, as well as waste management companies. Um, so they should definitely strive to find people who have like-minded, eco-conscious values um, like they do. And then ultimately, they're going to be the educators and the advocators for the festival attendees. Um, they're going to have to make it known to them the different sustainable practices that they can put into place while they're at the music festival. Um, so next we have the festi music festival goers. And these is, this is going to be the audience, the attendees of the music festival, um, the ones enjoying the music, as well as the ones probably making the most waste throughout their time at a music festival. Um, so this requires them to have a certain level of compliance and commitment to follow um, the sustainable practices that are given out by the festival planners. Um, they also need to have a level of personal responsibility to understand their individual impact on the environment and how to reduce this impact. Um, next we have the artists, and we thought this was an important group because ultimately these are people that the attendees are coming to see, um, and a lot of times the festival goers will look up to these artists as role models or inspiration. Um, so this gives artists the opportunity to um, influence the audience um, in implementing sustainable practices in their everyday lives. Um, and one way they can do this is holding eco panels. Um, a lot of music festivals do this, and artists will just sit in front of an audience, answer questions, um, and discuss their environmental concerns um, while advocating to the audience ways to become more sustainable. Um, and then there's already environmentally friendly artists that are um, putting this into action, such as Jack Johnson in his last tour. Um, he eliminated all single-use water bottles, he sold reusable and recyclable merchandise, and he also used biodiesel to fuel all of his tour buses. And then finally we have the local community, um, and we thought they were important because they're going to be the ones that are not impacted only during the music festival, but for weeks or months to come after the music fest festival's over. Um, so it's definitely important for the music festival planners as well as the attendees to try to reduce their impact as much as possible um, so they can re remain, or remain having good relationships with the local community. Um, and an example of this is Coachella. Um, some positives that they brought, definitely every year they um, supply like thousands of temporary jobs for the local community as well as bringing in millions of dollars in revenue. Um, but every year since Coachella started, after the festival is over, there's community members that are always um, having concerns with issues about traffic congestion as well as noise and air pollution. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the main environmental issues that we've identi identified coming directly from music festivals. We're going to touch on the solutions that we're going to propose uh, later on in the presentation, but just to give you an idea of what those problems are, we're going to talk about those now. 
So for the first one, it's going to be waste. This is probably the most um, visible uh, impact that you'll see from a music festival, and it includes a variety of different things. So one of them is going to be smoking, um, and with that, butt disposal. Oftentimes, there's a lot of smoking at different music festivals, and because you're kind of in this tight space, like you're outside, already like adopted habits, it's really easy to just kind of throw the cigarette butt on the floor. Um, and then just not think twice of it, leave the festival. And because it's something that's kind of uh, relevant today or you see so often today, a lot of the volunteer, the cleaning groups, don't like bother even cleaning them up. Um, this is pretty dangerous for the environment just because a lot of times, because all those extra butts are now left on the festival grounds, uh, it can actually end up in the waterways of the local community's water system just because of rain or storm water, and that can harm the local wildlife. Another uh, issue is gonna be human waste. We all gotta go, no matter if it's at a festival or wherever else. Um, but a lot of times, because uh, we're not really thinking about what the whole process of that, uh, we ignore the fact that porta potties can use a lot of harsh chemicals that are really environmentally, um, can be harmful for the environment, as well as using a lot of non-biodegradable materials. Um, food and beverage waste, you know, you got forks, silver, cups, all that kind of stuff. Now taking into consideration that 32 million people attending a music festival, Everyone's probably got to eat food at some times. That can be a lot of waste uh, just being produced just from food and beverages. Um, if not sorted properly, that can have a dramatic impact on the uh, local community's waste system. Um, and finally, camping waste. Many of you might not know this, but camping actually, um, well, camping waste specifically, counts for 80% of waste produced at a festival. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of start adapting like the disposable mindset. When you're kind of camping, like, you're not really thinking about it. It's a short period of time. Um, just kind of going there and kind of roughing it. Um, but because of that, uh, a statistic that I found pretty shocking is about one in every six tents are left behind at a music festival. And unfortunately, a lot of those tents end up in the local landfills. And again, taking in consideration about 32 million people, and maybe not all of those festivals are camping, but that's still a lot of tents ending up in the uh, local landfills. <coughs> So the next problem we identified um, was water and the impact that music festivals can have on the local water resource. Um, Large-scale festivals can easily use over 20 million gallons of water, providing for festival employees, artists, um, festival attendees, and festival volunteers. Um, the main domains of water management at a music festival are going to be dealing with wastewater. This is water produced um, from vendors, uh, human waste, like Hope mentioned as well. Um, the proper uh, storage and disposal of this water is critical. Um, also, providing clean drinking water for all those at the festival. Um, the festivals in America typically take place during the summer months when it's really hot, so it's critically important that there's ample supply of clean drinking water for everyone involved at the festival. Um, also, reducing water waste, um, uh, water that doesn't make it into the receptacles, um, uh, collecting that, um, accessing it, and then reusing it uh, in festival operations um, during the festival time. All right, and next we have air, um, and the biggest concern with air throughout music festivals is going to be the transportation emissions, whether that be through tour buses or um, the festival attendees traveling to and from the festival. Uh, we couldn't find any direct data correlated with tour bus emissions strictly for music festivals, um, but in the music industry as a whole, tour buses account for about 150,000 tons of carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere each year. Um, but an even greater concern would be festival goer travel to and from a music festival. Um, on average, a person travels about 903 miles just to a music festival. So taking into account that about 32 million people um, in the United States go to a music festival each year, we can see how great the emissions from that are. Um, so festival goer travel to and from a music festival accounts for about 80% of the total emissions in a music festival setting. And then finally, we have energy. Um, of most concern is obviously the non-renewable energy sources um, that are going to be present throughout a music festival. So we have the transportation aspect, which I just spoke about, and then we have generators. Um, so generators are used throughout music festivals to power the stages, whether that be audio, lighting, or video, and then also different aspects of the site infrastructure, um, such as catering areas, um, production offices, as well as oh, camping areas. All right, so after we identified the stakeholders involved and the problems we wanted to focus on, um, we got into uh, research. Um, so using some ISAT alumni connections, we were able to get in contact with Jeremiah Jenkins. He's currently the uh, event coordinator of the Harrisonburg Downtown Renaissance. Um, he also is a major player in the Red Wing Roots Festival, which, take, which takes place in Natural Chimney, just south of here. Um, he was a great resources, resource. He uh, gave us some great insight into the intricacies of event planning. Um, 
And when we approached him, the guidebook idea was kind of still in its infancy. So he was a great resource, um, kind of uh, you know reinforcing the the idea that this was going to be important. Um, so the first thing he mentioned to us was the importance of selling uh, environmental practices to promoters and sponsors. Um, this can be used as a great marketing tool to uh, attract more sponsors and attendees. Um, and then the additional revenue from the um, greater sponsors and attendees can then be used to counterbalance the expenses of um, sustainable practices, which are often more expensive than the run-of-the-mill um, like waste management, stuff like that. Um, he, additionally, he talked about the importance of venue size and type in um, uh, the cultivation of a sustainable music festival. Um, for example, the Red Wing Roots location um, kind of creates this natural capacity. So after um, the, uh, the attendance, um, the maximum size was met, the promoters there were able to shift their focus from getting more people at the festival to creating a sustainable festival. Um, and they did this through eliminating all plastics at the festival as well as implementing full-scale recycling and composting operations. Um, the last thing he was um, quick to mention was the uh, the importance of the ease in, of involvement of the goer um, as far as uh, the success of the sustainable practices um, implemented by the planners. It's really important for the goers to be um, engaged and captivated by the uh, practices so they will um, actually carry through. After we spoke to him, we talked to Ann and Derek Bedarf of the Adaptive Collective. Um, the Adaptive Collective is a waste management nonprofit organization um, based out of Charlottesville. Um, they work at a lot of different festivals, um, specifically within the Virginia area. Um, and they gave us great insight into the waste management aspect, um, which we wanted to learn more about because it is such a, um, a negative impact on the environment um, that is the result of music festivals. Um, and we were also able to present our guidebook to them um, after we had kind of uh, fleshed it out a little more. Um, you know, talk to them about things that they had used in the past that had worked, things that we had thought of that may or may not work in the future. Um, the first thing they mentioned was that pre-festival planning and communication was critically important. Um, making sure all parties involved know where the waste goes, know how to sort it, um, what goes where is really important because um, once you get into the, fe the festival atmosphere, um, things can get very hectic very quick. Um, they also describe this approach that they take to any challenges and obstacles they face. Um, they go green by de default. Um, this means that whenever they're faced with an obstacle, they try to you know, react to it in the most environmentally friendly way possible. Um, this sets a great precedent to festival employees and volunteers that they, make, they may work alongside during the festival time. Um, Similar to Jeremiah Jenkins, they also describe the importance of incentivizing um, festival goer involvement um, by giving them rewards and prizes for compost and recycling. Um, you're further, um, you're, you're improving the success rate of those practices by making sure that they come back and do them again. So after we talked to some people out in the field, we decided to go do it ourselves. Um, the first festival we attended was Lockin Music Festival in August of 2016. Um, there we worked in the green team alongside Venue Smart, which was, was, was the waste management company that they brought in to, to take care of that. Um, we, our main involvement was uh, you know, interacting with goers, encouraging them to dispose of waste properly, giving them trash bags, picking up trash. Um, So we gained some great first-hand experience in the, how hectic music festivals get. Um, there's lots of moving parts, uh, things going on simultaneously to make sure music festivals go, out with, go on without a hinge. Um, and the knowledge we gained there, it was really interesting to see the large amount of waste. Um, you know, we talked about the numbers, but seeing it firsthand really gives you a better idea of, of how much um, of the environmental impact is created. Um, we were also able to um, see the severe lack of communication between parties involved, um, that really lessened the efficiency of the waste management team overall. There was lots of confusion um, during our time there. Um, and our biggest takeaway was probably that there was room for improvement. Um, this served as a great resource to us because it kind of reinforced the fact um, that something like this guidebook is needed and um, improvement of festival um, tactics needs to happen. Um, after that, we went to the Virginia Wine and Garlic Festival. Uh, much smaller festival, but still some good takeaways from there. Um, the biggest one was the importance of community involvement. We worked alongside members of the Amherst Rotary Club that had volunteered their time um, for the, the winery that it took place at. And in turn, the winery gave a, pr um, a portion, portion of the profits uh, back to the Rotary Club, which they then used to buy globes for all third graders in, in Amherst County. So it was a great way to see that 
community involvement can be leveraged to um, help the festival planners and the festival itself as well as the community um, surrounding the festival and really just help the longevity of the festival um, into the future as well. All right, so now we're going to get into our website and show you what that's all about. <coughs> Yeah, so the first page, um, when you first go to our website, just kind of a little intro page. We created this infograph because we realized um, it's kind of hard to catch people's attention, so we just wanted to throw out some eye-opening facts firsthand. Um, and then this is just followed by a little intro, um, introduction paragraph, kind of explaining these statistics. All right, so the first tab we have here is for the festival goers. Um, we broke down the festival experience into three different phases, um, preparation, immersion, and farewell. Um, in the preparation phase, the biggest, uh, the biggest focus is on um, being conscientious when you're planning for a festival. So that's eliminating plastics in the items that you're bringing. Um, meal planning is a great way to uh, uh, limit your carbon offset into the atmosphere. Um, focusing on transportation, you know, gathering your buddies up and getting into one vehicle instead of all taking separate vehicles. And also looking into public transportation. Um, immersion, the main focus on this section is to raise the personal responsibility of the festival goers once they're in the festival setting. Um, so just identifying where waste disposable takes place, you know, being um, aware of your surroundings, <coughs> where recycling goes, where composting goes, where normal trash goes, is a huge, a huge asset to, um, you know, making a, a festival less uh, environmentally negative. Um, and then the farewell, uh, we introduced this principle uh, called leave no trace. Um, this is leaving the campsite or the field or wherever you may be um, just like you found it once you're heading out. Um, like Hope mentioned earlier, one in six tents are left behind. So making sure you gather all your items and get them out of there. Um, you know, dispose of them correctly. Don't leave it behind for someone else to clean up or for potentially no one to clean up. So the next uh, section that we have is for the festival planners. Uh, when we originally approached this idea, we actually wanted to do a guidebook, like an actual book. Uh, but then we kind of realized like that's not really a, an easy access for a different planner or festival goer. Uh, so hopefully we wanted this website to be a place where a specifically even like festival planners, someone who has so many different moving parts, you know, there's so much that goes into planning a festival. Yeah. They can just pull it up on their phone and just kind of use that as like a checklist of just like, oh yeah, I didn't think about, I could, I could reduce my waste impact by doing that, it's this kind of thing. Uh, so it's broken up a little bit differently than the planner. It's a little bit more straightforward because, you know, we recognize that the planner's time is very precious. There's a lot going on. Um, so like waste management, these are things that they can do, um, just like suggestions of things like, you know, implement a volunteer team where they're like the waste management crew. They can go around, you know, check all the receptacles, stand, uh, assign people to stand in front of different recycle or composting bins, um, educate them a little bit so they have um, a way to provide information to guests or festival attendees that might not know the, uh, about recycling or composting. Um, for camping waste, like promote uh, glamorous camping or like reusable tent uh, experiences, you know, cigarette butts, promote um, reusable ashtrays or even just like smoking sections to monitor uh, the butt disposal so we can make sure that it actually goes in the trash. Um, and again, for different trashes, like make sure they're color coded and easily labeled. And then for food and beverage, again, just things that they might not be thinking about are easy to overlook, like things like, are you uh, getting local vendors involved? Are you, um, you know, uh, making sure that these vendors are using compostable utensils in place? So they're using recyclable material. Um, just being conscious of that. And also for water, do we have enough water stations? Can we incentivize the guests to um, use reusable water bottles instead of just like, you know, easily just one and done disposable kind of things? Um, and then for energy, um, some <coughs> simple solutions would just be reducing energy waste. Um, simply turning off equipment throughout the music festival could reduce a lot of power used. Um, then also using biodiesel fuel generators, which contain a lot less carcinogens and particulates than regular um, generators. And then um, also doing carbon offsets, which is something that the festival attendees can purchase um, to offset their carbon use somewhere else, such as like a methane farm, um, reducing methane from a farm. And then, um, like Jack said, in the festival goers, we just went over transportation again because it's important that the festival planners let the attendees know um, their more sustainable options when traveling to and from the music festival. And we just wanted to include the stakeholder section to remind the festivals <coughs> of all the different stakeholders at play. You know, are you thinking about the local community and are you thinking about the artists when you're planning these big events? Um, yeah. We encourage you all to check this out, um, whether you're planning on going to a festival, planning a festival maybe, or uh, just want to be more sustainable in your everyday life. Um, you can find it at environmentallyintune.wordpress.com. I think Taylor wrote it over there. Uh, feel free to check it out, share it. We'd love for it to get out there and be a viable to tool for people um, interested in this in this field. So. 
So one of the biggest takeaways we wanted this to produce this, you know, this guidebook of the website to just kind of like start implementing is this idea of promoting a green lens. You know, using music festivals as a tool to start getting people, whatever stakeholder artists, you know, the community, the people going or the people planning, to start looking at this world like in a more sustainable and like green kind of way. Um, we're hoping that like by learning all these different tools and practices at a music festival, it would encourage again all the stakeholders involved to not only do it at a festival but also to start implementing it in their on their daily lives. Uh, we want this to start to becoming the norm. Like the norm would be to think more sustainably and to think more green. Um, and just for some future exploration and projects, uh, this isn't a new and upcoming like field. There wasn't a lot of research, so just to be a part of that research, start again, keep going to the festivals. Um, maybe future ISET students can continue to collect data, so we can be a part of this, um, as well as test the guidebook. You know, pass it out. Are there holes? Is there anything that we could have included that's not there? Is there anything that wasn't feasible that we kind of thought uh, would be, but it's definitely not. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this project could continue to be carried. And we'd love to see that too. I mean, we're really passionate about that. I know that a lot of people my age are really passionate about music and music festivals. Um, and it's a fun way to, you know, kind of try to save the world, you know, have some fun. <laughs> um, so, so we'd just like to thank our, our wonderful advisors, uh, Dr. Shannon Connolly and Dr. Stephen Preisinger. Um, they had great advice, um, very uh, perceptive, insightful, and very patient as well. Um, Dr. Morgan Denton was, was kind of like a catalyst when we, were, when we were starting this. We didn't really know how to approach it. Um, he just really instilled in us to you know, follow your passion and, and be passionate about your work as well. Um, Jeremiah Jenkins for uh, giving us some of his time and his insight into a, event planning and cultivating a successful, sustainable music festival. Um, and then Derek Biedorf of the Adapt Adaptive Collective for their helpful tips and wise words regarding the, uh, the guidebook. Um, they were really able to help us nail that down well. Um, also, uh, Albert from Venue Smart was a gentleman we worked uh, alongside at um, Lock-In. He really helped us adapt to the festival experience and gave us some great perspective on the importance of waste management um, at a festival and also in everyday life. So I think at first it started with the identification of the stakeholders. Um, we realized that they were all important, but the festival goer and the festival planner themselves were going to be the ones most involved in producing the waste and also encouraging um, the reduction of waste. Um, so we wanted to put the focus on them and then just be able to, it kind of first started out as like a checklist where they could just go down and say like, I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, but that seemed like a little too direct. So by making it um, accessible through a website, um, and also um, just making it broader and general, you know, tips and stuff like that, as also um, with some specifics as well, um, we thought would be the most effective way. Um, so yeah, and also, you know, not wasting paper by keeping it on.